My name is Levi Sim, and this is the Photo Focus webinar, where we'd like to help you learn some skills and techniques to help you be a better photographer and or videographer in this case. My guest today is Andrew Diamond, who is a full-time videographer and has a, a long history in photography and video. And I am glad you're here, Andrew. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your experience? Yeah, thanks for having me. So I've been doing video, I think this is my 12th year since I really started getting into it. I mean, obviously I did stuff, you know, earlier on in my childhood and youth, but as far as getting paid to do video work, it's now 12 years. Um, I work full time for Utah State University. That's a little graphic on the background. Um, and I, I do marketing the content for them. And that's mainly, you know, that's what my kind of bread and butter for what I do for video work. On the side, I also do some lighting videos and stuff like that. I've had experience in live productions, sporting events, different things like that through the university. And so it's kind of given me a well-rounded experience altogether with different types of video work and different clients and interacting with different people. So. I enjoy it. I'm happy to be here and happy to be working with Levi on this webinar. Yeah. And as you may or may not know, I also work at Utah State University as the uh, campus photographer. And that's how I know Andrew. But I started working with Andrew nearly 10 years ago, eight years ago, on projects as a, as a freelancer myself. And, um, and I've learned a whole lot working with Andrew and I thought you all might enjoy learning some of those things too, especially where this is kind of sort of a mirrorless podcast and we use mirrorless cameras. If you are not using a mirrorless camera for, um, for video and, and photography, you will be. And especially for video, it's, it's the way to go for sure. Uh, yeah, Joe, thank you for telling us that the audio is, isn't in sync and cutting out. Andrew, do I sound okay to you? You do now, like right at the beginning, it cut in and out, but it seems to be smooth on my end. Okay, and you, you sound smooth to me too. Um, again, I'm gonna blame the blizzard, so. Uh, Sony Shooter for is Craig, all right, Craig. Uh, they, yeah, Sony certainly makes a, a wonderful camera for doing video and photography. Um, Andrew, we've got some ideas to talk about here because like making videos has some significant differences, both creatively and technically from photographs. Like we're using the same lenses. We can use super shallow depth of field. We can use long lens, wide lenses. We can use the same camera bodies, but there are some very specific technical settings and then also some, some creative choices that uh, can significantly affect the quality of our our end product, and um, and so I'd like to I'd like to talk with you about some of those if you don't mind. Yeah. And we were thinking of some things. Like yeah, I mean, even I as can basic go as into some of it. The, the, you know, yeah, please. You know, when when I'm working with Levi and he's doing photos and I'm doing video. Like some of the things I always get jealous on is as a photographer, you know, they're able to crank the shutter speed as much as they want with right. the oil effects. So when it's bright outside, you know, they can be shooting at one two thousandth or whatever it is of a shutter speed to be able to cut down the light, maintain that shallow depth of field. And as video, we still can, but obviously when you start getting motion in it, it makes your hands go all jittery. It, it changes the movement of the action. And so that's one thing that, you know, we always have to consider and rely heavily on either NDs or just opening up our aperture or dealing with that stuttered motion. Um, yeah. So when you, when you change, when you use the wrong shutter and you, we could say the wrong shutter speed, it's not like, it's not like you've, you're choosing the shutter speed and this one kind of looks a little different. Yeah. There, there are some like, some specific uses you know like a lot of times on action movies or different things like that they'll increase the shutter speed so it reduces the motion blur 
and then that'll give a more action lively environment that's a little bit more hectic versus a nice smooth like right now when i move my hand it's a lot of motion blur going on right now right. part of that's due to the quality and i'm in a darker room but so in video usually you know there's the rule of 180 where you want your shutter speed to be roughly two times that of your frame rate so if you're shooting at 24p you know your shutter speed should be 148th or 150th if you're shooting at 60p 120th of a second and so that's kind of the standard rule for kind of your your shutter speed with video so your shutter so, speed should be twice your your film speed your fps yep yeah. yeah. and you know there are ways you can cheat that and and get away with ignoring that rule if you don't have an nd filter to reduce the light um you know if you're say you're just interviewing a talking head and they're not moving much well you're you're likely not going to notice as much motion because there isn't as much much motion in the shot and so you know sometimes there's those situations where like if we're shooting into a teleprompter and then we're putting an nd on it and then we're going through the lens and there's light shining in sometimes you can get some weird reflection issues between all the different layers of glass going on and so we might cheat and increase the shutter speed or decrease the aperture on the lens a little bit and kind of blend the two but for the most part that's one thing that video has to be a little bit more strict on with their camera settings than photo yeah like you like if you want to have a shallow depth of field you've got to darken the picture overall and so that that's what nd what does the nd what do those mean yeah uh neutral density filter it's basically like sunglasses for your lens so it, it reduces the light coming in so that you can still have your aperture on your lens opened up and and to create that shallow depth of field but not overexposing your image and so there's kind of those three tools of an nd to block the light coming in your shutter speed for reducing the light coming in and then your aperture for limiting the light hitting your sensor and you are you less likely to change your iso around yeah so with iso you know in photography you can use some noise reduction within lightroom and compensate for some of the extra noise in video you you can there are noise reduction tools but one they take a lot of processing power and time and two you they just don't have as good of an effect so you know video we're a little bit more cautious as far as how much we raise the iso i mean even on the sony full frames and different things like that there there are some limits that in the end photo always tends to reduce the grain from iso more than video does interesting okay um and so lots of lots of photographers use nd filters as well neutral density filters in order to get a slower shutter speed so that we're we're darkening our entire photograph and that's how we get like the the cotton candy looking waterfall or the the smooth lake water or the the ocean being all smooth looking instead of being um choppy but you're using it in order to keep the shutter speed and more as an effect of like aperture like you're enhancing your aperture kind of you're, you're making your aperture darker without changing the aperture it's kind of because you because you just can't change the shutter speed yeah i mean we shouldn't i guess in right. most cases yeah and so you know when we're shooting outside in the sun and we we still want that nice shallow depth of field we'll lean on nd filters to to allow us to get that tell us a little bit about frame rate so we've got we've got the the number of pictures that are being taken per second right yep. why why do we have the different frame rates briefly <laughs> Which one should we use is the main question. I mean, there's usually two crowds, those that like 24p for standard video projects and those that like 30p. Um, television tends to be broadcast in 30p. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to shoot in 30p for it. Um, movies and that, the more cinematic feel are usually in 24 um, frames per second. So basically we use both 24, 30 and 60 all the time, sometimes more if you have a special need that's, we really need to slow it down. But- you know, so, so when you shoot in 60 and publish in 30, 
you're effectively shooting in slow motion. So to shoot slow motion, you have to shoot faster. Yep. So we set, you know, most of our projects are always either 24 or 30 P in our editing. So mm -hmm. the final delivery is going to be 24 frames per second or 30 P. Um, when we're shooting, we have the option of, you know, if it's a talking person, we know we're not going to do slow motion of them just talking during an interview. So we shoot that in 24 P. Okay. Um, or you could do 30 P depending on which, which you prefer. If we're shooting B-roll, that it's like, okay, we know, you know, there's some nice motion, but we want to slow it down a little bit, give it a different feel. We'll shoot at 60p. And then that will allow us in our post to then say, okay, you know, we have 60 frames per second on a video clip. We are gonna slow those down. So now we get two and a half seconds of video for that 60p. So it slows it down 40% where we aren't, we're still seeing every single frame being captured. But that 60 frames in one second is now spread out over the 24p timeline. So it's kind of a hard concept to explain, but just know that 60p allows you to slow it down without artificially trying to frame blend or do any other manipulation. It's just showing it in its true form. And if if I play if I play the 60, like say so say I record in 60, but I don't end up using. Uh, slow motion for it. Am I am I still getting sound? Depends on the camera. So yeah. you know the camera I use. We have a Panasonic S5 or GH5s. Um, when we record in 4K 60p, we do get sound and it plays back at 60p and normal in the camera. Or when we play it back on a computer, some cameras like if you have your iPhone and you go to the slow mo option, it will play it back slower. Um, other cameras won't record audio at higher frame rates or it'll record at a slower. So like on the GH5, for example, if you go to the 120 frames per second, for example, and you hit record, it's capturing everything live. But when you play it back, it's actually only writing it as a 24 or 30p video clip without audio. And so it plays back actually in camera by default at slow motion. The video is recorded in slow motion by default. So it, it, every camera is different and that's where you yeah. just have to know your camera and know what you're doing and know the limitations of it. And that goes back to audio as well. Like if you know your audio is important for this shot, you know, one, if you slow it down, it's not gonna sound great because it's gonna, you know, spread the sound out but you can still, you know, put sound effects into your shots or different things okay. like that. Interesting. So my camera will go up to 120 frames a second. So it's, it's shooting, it's recording a lot of pictures all at once. And then it plays back very slow. Is it, I, I feel like, I feel like it's a little bit like a vignette in Lightroom where when I discovered vignettes and like, you could go on my blog and see the day I discovered vignettes, right? Because everything has this dark circle around it and, and it, it doesn't look, uh, it's overused, but with time I've, I've mellowed on my use of vignettes and things. Um, and I, I, I feel like maybe slow motion's a little bit that way too, where I've got this really cool tool and perhaps I'm overusing it and using it too bluntly and things. Do you have any do you have any suggestions for for using slow motion? You know, there, there's a lot of things that can go into it. You know, if you're using slow motion heavily, a lot of times with video, you're putting it to music. So your music should go with mm -hmm. what you're doing. And you can still use slow motion clips, but maybe if it's a faster paced song, you're cutting faster. So making quick cuts also alludes to a faster pace, even though the animation or the motion of the video that you're watching is in slow motion. So, so that's always one thing that you should consider is how you cut it in a way that fits your sound so that it has some change of pace and momentum. The other thing is um, not everything needs to be slowed down and you can mix and match and different things like that. So, you know, lately on, on a wedding that I did, I shot some in 30 p with the intention of I can only by default slow it down 80%. Mm -hmm. So it's it looks more natural. It's not as like super slow 
animation, but it gets rid of some of the faster movements that might happen. You know, blinks are just a little bit slower, turning their heads just a tiny bit slower, but it's not like super slow motion where they're just slowly moving. And so, yeah. you know, like you said, some people will tend to, once they have the higher frame rates, shoot everything in the higher frame rate and then slow everything down to the max. Um, I know like Sony's on some of their cameras, they'll do 120 at 1080. And so people will shoot at 120 and slow down the 120 into a 24 frame per second timeline. And then it's just like, it's almost like you're pausing motion for everything and there's not enough movement. So you feel like the video really, broke because it's not, it's not progressing. <laughs> yeah. And, and you don't want to get to a point in a video where people are just, it's, it's too slow. There's no change of pace. There's no momentum going. So you really, I mean, there's not one general rule to say like, Oh, you should never use slow motion for anything, or you should always use it for something. It's that's part of your creative development is trying to figure out how to, change it and keep the audience engaged and do it in a way that hopefully doesn't rely on one trick to to get their attention yeah oh that's super helpful um oh man there's there's several questions i have there uh regarding re regarding like length of, of videos and things. Sometimes when I make a landscape picture, I want to see everything and I use a wide angle lens and I get it all in, you know, and I see the whole, the whole mountain range. I've got the sky, I've got the grass and stuff. But then sometimes I'll use like a 300 millimeter lens and photograph this, this one uh, section of the field with the one piece of cliff coming down and another piece like this and the, the little cloud and the thing. And it's the same view and all this stuff, but, but sometimes I get it all in and sometimes I, I focus very tightly and imply the whole, <laughs> what, what is, what is your idea for, um, for like a finished length of a video? Like what, what's your ethos going into editing and like, how, how, how like, how'd you get there? Duration of video content. I mean, yeah, kind of, yeah. That it's it's a loaded question. I mean, I always try to I try to toe the line of long enough to keep it. I mean, it's kind of like the skirt reference, <laughs> but you know, it needs to be long enough to to get everything to cover the subject, but short enough to keep the user engaged and entertained or fully attentive. And so, you know, if I know I, I'm going longer, you know, like I don't want to deliver a, a wedding video that's a minute and a half long. Otherwise mm -hmm. they'll look at me and be like, oh, like that's it. But right. things I do, you know, I use different songs. I use songs that have different momentum so that I can, you know, maybe start out slow and then get to a spot where it picks up the pace. I, I change my cuts. I'm changing environments and, and doing that in a way that kind of carries the viewer through the production. So I think, there's no right or wrong answer, especially in today's world with social media, with, you know, Instagram doing 60 second limits or Twitter, I think has two minutes and 20 seconds for their native video. So every video is going to be different. It's just a matter of how do you find out a way to keep the user engaged. And if it's a learning, if, it, if you're teaching something, keep it short enough where they can retain the information, but also actually learn it. So every video content has a different answer i guess and as, as you change a song it could almost be it's almost like watching a different video now like it's, it's almost like you've entered a new a new chapter of, of yep. the book but you've, you've got these you've got these segments laid out and they, they blend together and they're they're related but they transition and and keep you interested throughout the whole thing um, and I've like, I've seen some really good wedding albums of photographs that are, are kind of that same way. Like here, here's this section of pictures and they, they proceed through the, through the event and, and kind of help us understand the things that happened. And they're not all just beautiful standalone images. There's, there's transition pieces in there too. Um, which also reminds me of something else I learned from you 
I think during one of the, the first videos I made, um, there's all these cool tools in, in photo or in uh, Premiere and, and the other video editing tools. I use Adobe Premiere and there's these transitions and you can do these crossfades and whatever. And, and, the, and so I had these, these transitions is what the thing is called that, that takes you from that, like it goes black between clips and things. And, and I sent you this video to review for me and you said, yeah, not bad. Um, maybe don't use so many transitions. And so now I don't use any. And I think my, my videos are much better for it. Tell, tell me, like, how, how, do you, how do you use transitions as a, as a garnish? Yeah, I mean, I tend not to use all the crazy transitions. I mean, if anything, I only go to those if I'm dealing with graphics, like actual text graphics or different things where I want to bring things in in a different way. But maybe from an intro or an outro. Yeah, exactly. Right the, in, tapping the in the middle, in the middle of the edit, you know, I have to. I pretty much decide: does it need to fade to black? Is there a change of scene that I want to fade to black and set up mm -hmm. something new with a different song? And I need that, you know, end of chapter filling. I'll do black, or you know, is it kind of a montage where I need dissolving and I need I need things to flow a little bit more that way, and I'll use a dissolve. Or, you know, the most common one I use is just an actual cut. And, and with any transition, it's not just about what transition you use. You have to take into account what's your before clip and what's your after clip that you're transitioning mm -hmm. from. So, like, you know, jump cuts. That's, there's no transition, but it's a, it's a cut between two clips that look similar. And so that can, you know, in certain things like talking heads, explaining tutorials on YouTube and things like that, people get away or just talking like that's, that's its own style. But for wedding videos, you know, I don't want to cut from one shot like I am framed in this, in this view right now to another shot of the bride just in a slightly different spot. And so, Oh, like that's like jumping like this. Yep. Okay. And, gotcha. and so, you know, that's, that's the other thing that's so different with video is, you know, with photos, you can, you can put an album together and have similar framed pictures of, you know, someone, a bride and a groom and different, different spots, whatever. Yeah. In video, I've got to make sure I'm cutting between different frames. Otherwise it just stands out and I don't have to look at that. And so I'm always, you know, going from a wide shot to maybe a medium shot of the person or, mm -hmm getting a detailed shot of a dress or whatever to change the composition. And that's something that, you know, I think one of the best examples is if I look at filming a, a first look or a bride and groom seeing each other for the first time, you know, from a photo perspective, you can take your shots just however you need to, it doesn't really matter. From a video perspective, I've got to figure out how I'm going to be able to show that happen in different angles, different compositions. And so like I'll do stuff at the beginning before they actually see each other and get different shots. So I have different angles to cut to and I'm not just stuck with the one angle. So with video, that's, that's the one extra layer that I think sometimes it's not to say photo can't be creative with different angles or different shots, but in video, you can get burned really quick if you don't have different cutaways. And, mm -hmm. and you can't really make up for it because you've got to tell your story or tell that action that happens in a sequence. And in that sequence, you have to make sure you have different angles. So that's probably one of the hardest things, I think, transitioning from photo to video is making sure you have those different compositions to cover your scene. Yeah, so we need, we need stuff in between similar shots and then we can use transitions perhaps to change the thing completely like to go from the the wedding ceremony for instance to the reception maybe there's a transition in there i like the checkerboard one where everybody flips over just getting stars maybe yeah, maybe maybe a good rule of thumb is if it's included in powerpoint don't use it in a video <laughs> yeah. um, that's super helpful what about camera movement like, should yeah. I, should I be panning around? Should I, should I like in and out? Do I need to have a monopod? What, what should I do? 
Yeah, so camera, I mean, at the very basic, like you said, with monopod, you know, you want a steady shot. So some cameras help out better than others. I mean, you've got cameras with built-in stabilization into the body, into the sensor itself that helps, you know, I can shoot handheld on an 85 millimeter prime lens with my camera and get a smooth shot because it has compensation in the camera itself. Even and and I, doesn't. I want to point out that you can do that. Yeah. And when I hold the same camera, I can't do it. Like when I've got yeah. the same setup, even though I've got the in-body stabilization, I don't have the, the habit and the practice to pull that off right right away you know even though even though my camera's got the stable so don't be fooled by thinking that your stabilized camera is the same as a, a movie or something yep and on top of that sometimes you might notice it even just with cell phones even even though they have some sort of stabilization like what looks good on a small screen <laughs> with shaking yeah. when you get it on a full screen it like you just notice it more and it becomes more distracting Right. So, you know, with movements, you know, people starting out, the best way is, you know, a tripod, get it stable, and that eliminates at least one point of failure that you could have in your video shoot. With movements of the camera, intentional movements, I mean, there's no right or wrong way. I would just say you don't want things to be moving always the same direction. It's, it's like anything, you need to tastefully use movement in your videos so that every clip doesn't move from left to right as you pan. And then you're stuck because that's one other reason you can be stuck in editing is, you know, first your shots aren't changing composition enough. So you're kind of having a jump cut in a way, or second, all your clips keep moving from left to right or right to left or up or down. And you don't want to go from, I mean, you, there are stylistic reasons why you could do it, but you don't want to always go from a clip that's moving down and then go to another clip that's moving down and then another clip, unless you're doing like, some sort of crazy transition sequence like that but yeah i've had i've had issue too where I've, I've made a whole bunch of video clips and then i get back on the computer and realize that none of them aren't moving that i that i panned for every like i was following the motion every time instead of getting 10 seconds of of no movement as well and like it it leaves me with almost no options for the video like if you watch TV or something, usually the camera isn't moving at all. Would you say that's true? Yeah, unless the subject's moving. Unless, yeah. And, and, and they, they're, they're following the moving. subject yeah. in some way. But even then, it's not always the case. I mean, so it's just another creative option you have to manipulate as a video person versus photo. I mean, you can still do movements and, and capture movements in a photo, but tracing the movements and using movements as a transition or making sure you have you know a different establishing shots that aren't moving so that you can bounce back and forth is just all part of the creative process that you'll develop over time right on and what um there's another rule of 180 right where where when we move the camera let's head, talk about that yeah so it part of that rule depends on your final project so what he's referring to like you know if i have an interview and i've got my camera as the webcam and i'm whipped off camera talking to the interview i i don't want to be splitting where i'm going to be looking at so i have if this is one angle and then i have a second angle where i'm turned the other way suddenly there's different uh, directions that my face is going to be bouncing back and forth. And so it's kind of the 180 rule where I don't want to break the 180 plane um, to where my head's looking different directions. Now in, in wedding videos where I'm mixing different locations and different things like that, it's not as big of a deal. But if I'm trying to set up a sequence of say the first look where one person's coming across, the other person's looking the other way, I don't want to keep bouncing back and forth where suddenly the groom is looking off camera one direction and then the next shot he's looking the other direction and it's it's it kind of messes with your the viewer's experience in the video content yeah yeah that's that could that could be really confusing and i've made that mistake unknowingly myself and then you like this these are the things that you don't realize you don't know 
that we've had a hundred years of people discovering all these things and, and tips to, to create a, a, a good culture of, of making good videos. Um, it, it's kind of, this, you know, if you watch sports or anything like that or live TV, for the most part, there's a reason all the, all the cameras are set up on kind of one side of the field shooting the other way. That's so the viewer doesn't get confused at getting it. Cause sometimes they will do this. They'll have a, you know, a camera guy roaming the field and he gets a shot from a different direction. And all of a sudden you see it and they're like, Oh, why is he running the other way? Right. <laughs> They've been going this way the whole quarter. So yeah, it, it can really throw out, throw off the viewer experience. If it's oh, that's interesting. Different. That's interesting. Um, well, thanks, Andrew. We're gonna we're gonna have to wrap it up pretty soon here. Do what? What uh, questions does anybody have? Go ahead and write them into the chat if you've got a question. And uh, real quick, Andrew, what what tips do you have for photographers working alongside videographers? Like, what are you like? Oh, man, you know, just got in my way. Yeah, with with anything, communication. I mean. If you, if you assume someone's going to get upset and feel like they did something wrong or the other person did something wrong and it was intentional. So, you know, with weddings where you have moments where you can't, you can't capture, you know, them saying I do for that one time or them coming down the aisle for that first time, like that's where you have to communicate in advance and, and work with the photographer or work with the videographer and say, Hey, this is where I'm going to be, you know, for video, this is where I am. This might be where I go make sure you're not in each other's shots. The other thing is when you're working with any other, even photographers working with each other, you want to make sure you're not always shooting across from each other. So mm -hmm. when I'm, you know, when I'm capturing something, I got my eye on the photographer as well. And if I see them start to go around the couple on the other side, I'm going to start to drift that way because I don't want them in my shot. So that like movements, positions and all that should be for the most part communicated before and just be aware of that. Um, because it, it, it burns video a little bit more than photo in the sense that now that clip might be fully unusable where the right. photographer might be able to take a shot, move to a different place, take another shot, and they just need one shot of that action. Um, and then let's see, the other thing is with action, you know, a lot of photographers will say, okay, hold right there, turn your head a little bit to the side, smile, put your hand right there. Okay, great, take the photo okay, you're done there. If you're working with a videographer, it's awesome if you're encouraging natural movements. So you can still direct them, but encourage the couples to not look at you and turn up the camera all the time waiting for direction. Like a, like a three-step direction, like, like look down there and then put your hand on his lapel and look in his eyes instead of now put your hand on his lapel, now look in his eyes. Kind of like yep. give him a, a whole action to do, not just steps. Yep, and tell them like, oh, keep looking in their eyes or different things like that so that the videographer, while you're doing those photos, can get usable content rather than, okay, you do all those photos and now we're just going to have to repeat all of it again. Mm -hmm. And so and on, on a lot of situations where video and photo are working together, taking as much, like taking advantage of the time allowed is better for both parties rather than trying to divide half the time where each of you are kind of interrupting and doing your own thing. And so... Those are probably the two biggest things. And then obviously there's the concern with flash, you know, flash doesn't exactly help the shot and video. And so, you know, if there are situations where the photographer really needs to use the flash, then I'll let them do a couple shots and then I'll jump in and get my stuff. Or I'll tell them like, I've had some issues where brides are walking down the aisle and they're going flash crazy. I'll say, I just need a, a two and a half, three second shot where I can get this without flash. And then after right. that, I'm good. Like, I just need that action shot. So those are all communication-based things and things you'll look at at the end. And, and if you're a photographer, follow up with the videographer after a shoot and just open those doors of discussion and say, hey, was there anything I did? Is there something I could do better in the future just so I am improving that relationship? That, that's great advice. Thank you so much. Uh, well, no one has weighed in with any questions. And... I'm, this, this was very succinct and very helpful for me. So I sure appreciate you joining us, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Where can we see your work or, or follow you? 
Um, so most of my work for university is just tied to the university and I don't post it on social media, but as far as wedding stuff, I'm somewhat active on there and it's on Instagram at adiamond.media. And so you're welcome to follow me there, reach out to me with any questions. I'm always happy to talk video and give advice or feedback or anything like that. So yeah, what, Andrew, Andrew's one of the best feedbackers I know. <laughs> sometimes to a, to a fault. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for joining us for this photo focus webinar. We will have this, the recording posted soon on photo focus again. So you can, you can come back and review it. And uh, thanks again, Andrew. And thank you all for joining us. We will catch you next time.